know, a lot of times you go to these conferences and uh, conference websites and a little bit daunting because they've got this really box structure and they want you to apply and then they'll review your application and then hopefully you'll get in and then you'll get to speak and then you have to worry about all of that, right? So before I get into how to actually submit a proposal, I want to start by talking about the types of talks. And I know you've probably all come across these, but I want you to think about it from a slightly different perspective. So the first is obviously keynotes, and some of you might be comfortable giving a keynote. These are usually invitation, right? So you've been doing some speaking, or you have just come up with an amazing new product or framework or you know, something that's compelling or con a contribution, and then you get asked to do a keynote. So that's a little bit more of a reserved, but we can work up to that. Uh, the second is a lightning talk, right? These are usually 5 to 12 minutes. They don't usually go beyond 15. They're really tight. If you're someone who loves to speak quickly um, and has just a very short idea or small idea you want to share, lightning talk is great. It's also a great way to get your feet wet, right? Because you don't feel like I have to be up there for like 30 to 45 minutes engaging people. You know, I just want to kind of get it over with. Lightning talk is great. But like I said, if it's going to be short, you just want to pick one, maybe two themes to talk about because there's not going to be a whole lot of time. The 5 to 12 minutes goes by really quickly. <laughs> So the second is a panel. And you can either decide to put a panel together, or you can decide to sit on a panel. So let's take the first. You decide that you want to put a panel together, right? This is where you have to think a little bit more in terms of how is the panel going to be balanced? You know, even if you bring five JavaScript engineers together, do each one of those have some level of expertise? How are you going to moderate the conversation? And what's each person's um, specific level of expertise and how is that going to shine, right? So you've got to be good at kind of driving the conversation to get a good panel. Um, the other is still having a clear subject and some takeaways for people. If you decide instead to sit on a panel, right, you still kind of want to put the effort and make sure that people are doing a good job representing you. Um, so you, you want to say like, hey, you know, I'm going to sit on this panel and these are kind of the few things that I think are important. And it's even okay to disagree with your other panelists. Um, it actually makes the panel more fun and interesting. So, so keep that in mind, but if you're at all a little bit nervous, then I would say start with the panel, right? Um, either hosting it yourself or joining one that somebody has said, hey, we need someone to come and speak on this that has your ex particular expertise. When you're on a panel, though, right, <laughs> don't be one of these people who like, sits at the end and is just like, you're like, why is that person even on that stage, right? I'm sure you've all seen these kinds of panels, mm -hmm. right? Contribute. And figure out what, you have to do a level of preparation. You still want to figure out what are one to like five talking points that you want to say. So that when somebody asks you a question, you're not like a deer in the headlights. All of a sudden you're like, oh, did you ask me something? Well, uh, yeah, maybe you should ask her instead, right? So you still want to be an active participant. And the reason I say this is because I have sat on panels where people come up to me afterwards and say, wow, you shared a lot of valuable insights, right? You kind of want to be that person, the person that's shared something valuable, even if it's controversial or even if it wasn't necessarily you know, super pithy, right? So keep that in mind. Panels still give you a, a chance to shine. Now, the fourth is actually my favorite, <laughs> but it takes a little bit of working up to, right? So if you are one of those people, like I said, who loves to train people, who loves to interact with other people, right, who's just like a born teacher, right, this is great for you. Because you get to do a few things, right? You get to obviously set the topic. You get to figure out who you want to actually have participate, because you specify you know, who the workshop is for. But it's a little bit more work, right? Typically, it's like two to three hours. And you have to make sure that it's still pretty tight, even given the time frame. And the reason that that's important is in a workshop, it's an intimate setting, right? You get a chance to connect with the folks that are there, which is why I love doing it. But if you aren't the best at presenting information clearly and succinctly, people will leave. I remember a few years ago, my co-founder and I went to an iPhone app uh, and uh, application um, workshop, and we're sitting in there. And for the first half an hour, you know, the instructor gave us a setup, and we were really struggling to get things set up because the instructions weren't clear. And then basically halfway through, we were just like, we're not getting anything out of this. So we ended up leaving, you know, even though we had paid for the whole thing, because she just wasn't particularly engaging, and the material wasn't very clearly laid out. So if you're going to do something like a workshop, right, you really want to make sure you've got the setup, 
you've got a code repository if you're going to be doing actual coding, or if you're going to be doing something hands-on, you've kind of tested all of that out, and that there are some clear takeaways that people are going to leave with. Um, and you want to keep it engaging enough that they stick around for the full you know, two, three hours of it. Um, and then if you have any follow-ups, right, it's certainly a chance to say, hey, ping me on email, or let's talk again in a month. Um, so it gives you that chance to connect with folks. Now, before you decide to submit a talk, or before you decide what format you want, the one thing that makes a huge difference in stage fright, in the quality of your talk, is how you engage an audience. And engaging an audience is really just about knowing who's going to be there. And the best way to figure out who's going to be there before you submit a proposal is to actually contact the organizers. And in a lot of conferences, people will respond. So you know, depending on the size, I think if you try to contact an organizer at like WWDC, they might be like, uh, you know. But for something smaller, right? Uh, even for Dreamforce, I think you can contact the organizers and say like, who's going to be there? And when I ask who's going to be there, what's the percentage of people who are technical versus non? Even digging deeper, like how many people are going to know JavaScript, or how many people are going to be from this type of company, like a big enterprise or a startup, right? And really get a sense of who's going to be there. Because that lets you then figure out what kind of talk you want to craft, right? And if it's a broad enough audience, you could you know, come up with something that is at an advanced level or intermediate or even beginner level. So keep that in mind, that you reach out to the organizers and ask them for some details. So the kind of questions you want to ask are, like I said, who's attending? What are their interests, right? Is this a JavaScript-only conference? Or is this a Java conference? Or is this a Ruby on Rails conference? Or is it a little bit wider? Is this only for web apps? Or is this you know, enterprise software? And then what's going to be their experience level? And like I said before, what kind of companies are they coming from? Now, uh, Carolyn actually set me up really well when she said the title is what you care about. And I always say start with a title, right? Because when you start with a title, a couple things happen. Immediately, people get what it is that you're trying to speak about, right? So even if you go up to your colleague or friend and tell them, they should get a sense of what's the talk about. And it is totally OK to have a long title, right? Think you know, Java variable names. Um, so keep your title. <laughs> you want them to know what the heck is going on, right? So, so a long title is totally fine. And then after the title, this is where things get a little bit fuzzy. You want to have a summary. That's maybe four sentences max, right? The first sentence is, what's kind of the point of this, right? The motivating factor behind giving this talk. Second sentence is your credibility, why you are the one that should be presenting this talk, right? Third and fourth can be some takeaways, as well as maybe the duration of the talk, or even the experience level of the person that's attending it. But that's what you have to put in your summary statement. And too often, people write these summary statements that are kind of really verbose or esoteric. And then the organizer is like, I don't know what, they, what they're going to speak about, right? And how you write is oftentimes how you speak. So the clearer you can make it and the clearer you can come across, it's really valuable. And there is nothing wrong in getting somebody to read a paragraph before you submit the work. Now, the third thing, after the summary, a lot of times um, in that uh, proposal, they'll ask you to put some takeaways. Takeaways are also like goals, right? So what is it that you intend to teach people in the talk that they'll then be able to go out and do themselves? Keep it to about three to five. It doesn't have to be you know, 10 takeaways. You're not going to be able to cover that. And that actually may be a little bit overwhelming for the people who are reading it later who want to attend. So keep it to three to five and really think about Maybe if you were the one attending the talk, what would you have wanted to learn? Right? What are you teaching that six or nine months ago you didn't know? A lot of times that's really helpful too. And then what's the format going to be? We talked about this before. Is it going to be a lightning talk? Is it going to be a panel? Is it going to be a workshop? And then here's what's really important, the level. Do not feel ashamed in giving a beginner talk. Right? There's no harm in it. There's so many people out there who are also beginners who really want to learn. And too often people are like, oh, I want to give this like, awesome talk on security. It's going to be like for five people. Well, that's great if you can do that. right? And if you can get an audience, that's fine. Do that. But I think too often people feel like, I can't give a talk until I'm at that level. But there's a whole lot of beginners. right? So I think, yeah, you should certainly do those expert talks. But for people who aren't at that expert level yet, there's no harm in giving a beginner talk. 
The key though is be clear, right? Be clear about what the talk is about and who it's for. And if you can do those two things, people will come out to hear you speak, right? Regardless of whether you went to MIT or you went somewhere else, right? Or you didn't even go to college, right? They will come out to hear you speak because they'll be like, this looks interesting and I'm, you know, I'm curious, right? And they're at this conference for a few days. They want to come and check it out. So don't feel like you have to have oodles and oodles of years of experience or tons of credentials under your belt in order to be able to speak. Thank you.